At Attingham, we've been exploring and investigating over the last 10 years a really exciting and complex decorative scheme on paper, which dates from 1807. It spans corridors and staircases on the first floor at Attingham above Nash's main staircase. John Nash designed the picture gallery in 1805. Leading from it is the grand staircase, meant for show as much as use. The secret doors on the second landing lead to two further staircases, hiding another secret that has been kept for over 150 years. Buried under many layers of red oil paint is an elaborate decorative scheme on paper, and our intention is to reveal and recreate it. It's so complex that we had to bring together a really specialised team of conservators to work on the scheme for us. The team comprised John Sutcliffe, artist and decorative painter. Alistair Peebles, expert on historic colours and paints. And Mark Sanderford, wallpaper conservator. I've worked for the Trust for some while on various projects and I've been involved here in the research of the project, discovering how the scheme has been constructed for possibly three years now, culminating as being here to, to work to actually uncover the 1807 scheme. So I've been involved quite a while on and off as we've found out how it is constructed and how it actually looks. Well, in the best part of 20 years, I, I haven't seen the possibility of uncovering a paper-based decorative scheme that's been buried for 150 years underneath oil paint. Many layers of predominantly red oil paint that's been painted over the surface of it, although are quite strongly bound to the original and are difficult to get off, have actually given quite a hard protective surface for the years of various uses of the, of the building. It's, it's been various functions, including some type of a college administration base. So it, it has offered some protection in, in a lot of ways. So we should perhaps be grateful that it's there. See, in that colour there, is that still sort of wet? That's still wet, yes. Yes, because I'm going to say it's quite a lot darker, isn't yes, it, yes. than that behind you? Yeah. At the moment, we're, we're using a fairly standard decorator's technique with some subtleties added for the delicacy of the underlying layers. With, with spirit-based nitromos, which is a proprietary paint stripper. Uh, and due to the nature of the, the paint that the original is painted in, being a, a casein-bound distemper, a milk protein-bound distemper, that resists the, the chemical nature of the, of the paint stripper, which liquidizes or liquefies the, the oil paint, but doesn't disturb the, the, the distemper below. Well, the first real excitement will be to see the whole scheme as it exists revealed. Um, but then for me as a painter, uh, recreating the corners and the, the lines, because the, the straight lines representing highlights and shadows are, are very important, all of that will be very exciting. I think that at the time, it would not have been very unusual. Um, there are instructions for doing this sort of scheme in um, manuals of the period. Um, but as a survival, it is very unusual, in particular because it's on paper, and therefore was always fragile. And so there may have been lots of other paper schemes like this, but they simply perished long ago. This one has survived, about 90% of it, 80% of it, largely because it's been painted over with oil paints um, s several times in the 19th and in the 20th century. It's been coated over with oil paint. It's a particularly nice section because it contains 
foliate designs and some of the panelling detail. So it's very satisfying cleaning it off. The sequence is essentially applying multiple coats of paint stripper so that it has time to really soak into the surface and leave it for as long as you, as you can, which means effectively 20-25 minutes before you do anything more to it. And then we are using very pliable, thin continental blades in order to just remove as much paint in one go as possible. It will then be coated up once more with nitromores, left for a few minutes, and usually at that point one can start working with another means of removal, which is, in our case, um, quadrupolo, the very finest steel wool that's made. Um, and we, we soak the steel wool in, in the um, paint stripper, and then we very, very gently clean over the surface and that will remove most of the remaining residue um, and then we wipe off using white spirit um, as a final neutraliser and cleanser. Then you really need to let the area dry in order to see what you've left behind because the picture changes once it's dry uh, and you can then return for even more delicate localised cleaning if uh, you feel that the area requires it. Running through the, the, the strip that I've just been working on is one of several areas of loss where it's not an area that I've removed, it, it's, it's historically present. So we don't know in every instance why the paper might have been lost to that area, but it's very clear in other areas of the staircase that it was lost, the paper was lost due to damp uh, and water damage and we obviously have to fill in those areas now that are missing. We'll, we'll fill them with new paper and then they'll be painted. This is a really rare and unusual decorative scheme on paper. It dates to 1807, which is exactly contemporary with the period that John Nash was here making architectural changes for the second Lord Berwick. And we can date this scheme as precisely as 1807 because on the back of the sheets of paper, which are all individual, about this size, there is a tax stamp. These were in the days before they had the capacity to make continuous rolls of paper. They had to do individual handmade sheets which were very expensive and were therefore deemed a luxury item and so they were taxed. And the tax stamp is on the back of each sheet of paper with the date of 1807. It's cleaned, thank goodness. It's uh, six weeks of tile really to get it clean, but it is clean now. And we're starting to repair the losses, the missing areas. So uh, we use a transparent sheet that's exactly the same size as the original paper sheets and uh, tack that to the wall and draw on the lines of the missing areas, both edges of the sheet. And I will use this to cut out a piece of paper that completes this sheet of paper so that it becomes a whole sheet again. And that's given a coat of paint first before it goes on the wall to get the brush strokes in the right direction. And then it's given a second coat of paint on the wall to, to finish it and get the final colour. And that's completed with the overlaps as they were originally, because this paper was put on from the top and from the right, so it overlaps uh, from the left and uh, from below. The paper is uh, a handmade wall paper made specifically for the job at around 110 grams per square metre by a, a handmade paper factory in Germany, in Berlin. Uh, it's a cotton fibred paper uh, and it is, is of elephant size, old fashioned imperial elephant size, which is 23 inches by 28 inches, uh, which is very difficult to get these days, so you have to have it made and it was just over £6 a sheet. 
which again is, is, is similar to the original in that it's quite an expensive commodity and was then. And when the original job was done, there was probably two and a half thousand sheets of paper on this job, which would have been an incredible expense for Lord Berwick. That's part of him showing off his money, I think. It's almost the most glamorous area on the staircase, so it, the, the pattern itself is quite distracting. It's a very even clean, so I'm very pleased with that, and it, but it will get the most attention. So I'm hoping that, and I'll gauge opinion when people visit as to whether the repair that's sitting there at the moment is considered distracting and whether it draws the eye, and if it doesn't, I, I hope to leave it just as it is, really. Our philosophy of approach to this scheme, in other words, how we wanted to actually tackle it, was very carefully thought through. Where it survived under the layers of paint, we wanted to uncover it and carefully conserve it. Where it didn't survive, either through water damage or just wear and tear, we wanted to recreate it to make it look as new as it would have done originally. So there is actually a contrast between these two different types of surfaces within the scheme. But we wanted that to be as honest and evident as possible. And what in fact the human eye does is to harmonise those two different surfaces. So if some people think that some areas of the scheme may look a little patchy, that's the reason why. So what we've got on the glass are pigment pastes made from powdered artist pigments um, mixed with a little bit of water to make them miscible. And uh, we've got Venetian red, yellow ochre and whiting, which both acts as the body of the paint and also as the whitening agent in it. So it's a, it's a pigment effectively as well. And a little bit of casein syrup which is the binder, it's the adhesive that sticks the paint together and makes sure that it doesn't lift. Those constituent ingredients make up the paint that we're using, which is a casing band of stamper. So it's a very simple mix. And in order to get all the pigments and the binder and the whiting well mixed in, we're, we're actually grinding them with a glass muller on, a, on the glass. Well, I'm making um, a about 50 of these right angle corners for the staircase and there are four different designs depending on how they sit with the light four different designs but they're used the right way around and in mirror so that's eight basically eight different designs um, each in four colours. So I have to cut, yeah, cut all the stencils for that and try them out several times over. And then now I'm just see how that comes out. Triangles are the um, registration marks so that I get it in the same place, get all, all four stencils in the same place every time. That should come up a bit paler as it dries. Uh, and there are 60 on this panel here. So there are 59 more white stencils to do. And now I'm mixing the base grey. There are actually three greys that have to be mixed. And they're all related to one another. They're just a sequence of tones of the same colour. And this colour consists of lamp black, yellow ochre and whiting, with a little bit of raw umber added towards the end of the mixing, just to warm it up a little bit. And I'm just going to sort of loosely mix them with the palette knife and then we'll start using the glass muller to really, really integrate the mix and make sure that all the little particles in the powder pigments 
are crushed and ground fine. Because what you don't obviously want when you start using the paint is for one of the pigments to come out in, as you're brushing out and there to be a streak, for instance, of black or a streak of yellow ochre. It's got to be incredibly well mixed together. That's the aim. And one of the slight anxieties we have is because the casein is a sort of milk byproduct, that it will actually go off, particularly this room's very hot. So we're keeping it in the fridge. The problem with this method, if it isn't a problem indeed, is to make enough volume of paint. So it's, it, it's a very labour intense, intensive method for making quantities of paint. I was a bit concerned about them high up, not having enough punch. But... In places, if you want to make the black really black, which it does, in a very few places it gets really black, you can add that by hand. Just a full flick. And the same with the white. Just tiny quantities. Yeah. But that's better done on the wall in a way. Because you don't want every single one to be done in the same way in that respect. Mm. Mm. Steps. Mm. I just think that it's really nice that you can actually see these people who are doing the conservation work actually doing it. Because at one time the National Trust didn't let you look at anything that was going on and it was all done and hidden away. And I think it's good now to be able to see what is going on. Do you just mostly work here? You've been, you I work for the Trust. all over the place, but I don't work for the Trust. No, you're a And we're all three... Specialist people. Independent. independent. Yeah. Mm. It's remarkable, though, as Ruth said, you can still find these craftsmen that can do these it things is, by hand. Because you think all those old skills are dead, don't you? And now they're suddenly here and doing the work. It must be... Must be wonderful for them. So we know where our National Trust membership money goes That's now. That's true. That's true. That's true. Yes. Well, every sheet has to be straight, yeah. otherwise you can't do that. Because all that's supposed to be pretty good. The reaction from the public, I believe, has been very positive. With uh, with lectures in the afternoon and and some chatting to them as they pass, I think they've, they've feels it's added something to the visit. And we're now in the West Gallery. Uh, part of which is being recreated from scratch, which is this area here, this new handmade pair being put on the wall, because it is a genuine feeling of recreating what somebody did 203 years ago and trying to do it to the same standard, with the same materials, in the same technique, to the point where I'm putting pieces of paper on the wall in almost exactly the same places that they did it. So where they had a, a, a trimmed area, I'm trimming too. So I'm trying to do it exactly the same as they did it. So that gives me some pleasure, yes. Five years ago, I spent two days in this corridor with all the windows blacked out with very strong light, shining up the walls so that I could see every edge of every piece of paper through the paint. And I, I didn't wear glasses before then. <laughs> One of the key things to grasp about this scheme is the fact that it's called a trompe l'oeil scheme, which is actually French for fool the eye or deceive the eye. It's actually a very complex scheme which makes a play of highlight and shadow one against the other. The highlight to give you an impression of a raised surface catching the light and the shadow or the darker lines making your eye think that it's a recessed area which of course it obviously isn't, it's a flat surface, but the scheme makes you think as though it has areas of relief. This sample was an opportunity to try out the colours that Alistair had mixed for the infill areas. You use a straight edge to hold your hand steady um, and make a little sort of rigid place between your finger and thumb that runs down the edge of the straight edge. And that way, so long as the paint's the right consistency, you will get nice straight lines. Um, in the north part of the corridor, um, which we've just finished, I reckon there are about a thousand yards of line there of various colours. The red line is to create a shadow from the imagined grey style 
And for that, because it's something over half an inch wide, you need a brush that will hold a great deal of paint so that you don't have to keep stopping and starting. Uh, then after that, we have a darker grey, which in this sample hasn't come out dark enough, so we've got to do a bit of work on that. <coughs> and then the thin black lines, of which there are four in this scheme, and um, they have to be really very thin. I use a, or fairly thin, I use a lining brush which is called a duck. Um, that's because the bristles are held in a, in a quill, which is from a duck's feather. Um, so there are four of those, and then the white lines to provide highlights on the other side of the style are done with a, a slightly wider brush, which is a large goose. They both hold a great deal of paint, and the black lines, one can usually get at least two feet of, of, um, of line in a single stroke. The critical thing is when your brush runs out of paint as you come down the, down the wall, you have to hold the straight edge in the right place, dip for more paint, not too much, and re-enter the line without preferably showing any, any blemish where, where you've re-entered it. In this space, we've decided to attempt to recreate the scheme as it would have appeared when it was freshly painted in 1807. And we've based the pink field colour, this light salmon colour, on a sample which we took from behind a bracket that would have held the handrails on the staircases. And so it's simply been matched to this little sample that's quite fresh. By having the light salmon colour for the, for the fields and the light grey, we were able to reconstruct the rest of the sequence of colours for the scheme. And the white, which we have over here. These remove some of the subjectivity that would otherwise enter into the decision making. There would be a temptation to um, decide upon these colours according to personal taste. We, we know that colours tend to, if they change over time, they tend to become yellower, for instance. They very rarely become cooler. So we could have we could have worked our way back to something like this, but this provides us with very much more support because it's a piece of material evidence. These will be kept safely. <laughs> but I do very much personally, and it's a very subjective thing, enjoy the, the corners that John's made. I, I think they're, they're very delicate and subtle. Um, uh, and because they've been stenciled, there's something about the stenciling process which gives this wonderful, um, in, in, the, in the same sense as I was talking about the lines being done in a single gesture, um, stenciling is a wonderfully sort of crisp, non-fussing way of dealing with things. You have a series of cutouts and you, you do each colour. It's, all, it's, it's, it's like a primitive form of printing and that's what it feels like. So they're very successful, I think. At the moment, we are busy in the south end of the West Gallery, having finished the north end of that gallery. But I'm just finishing up on the west stairs, some of these corners, uh, because some of them, they're nearly all stenciled, uh, and those have been done, but there are some that have to be hand painted because they're at odd angles because of the way the scheme meets the skirting board which is on a slope on the stairs. Uh, the, the most difficult thing about it is that you are crouched down by the skirting board 
and um, it can be a bit uncomfortable down there. But otherwise, it's just a matter of painting them. In total, on the two staircases and in the South Gallery, there are, I haven't counted, but certainly over 200 of them, mostly stenciled, as I said, but some hand-painted. And because of the strange manner in, in which the um, decorators did the job originally, some are hand-stenciled on the wall, whereas most of the hand-stenciling is, is done on paper and cut out and stuck on. The design is absolutely typical of its period. The light and shade in the design are there to give it the appearance of relief, as though it were a bit of plasterwork stuck, stuck on the wall. Very typical sort of process that one has to do in this kind of decoration. And um, I don't know about um, finding it specially enjoyable, it, but it, it's, um, it's what you do. <laughs>most intriguing aspects about this decorative scheme is the shadowy figure of which there are a pair standing on a plinth. It's meant to look like a stone statue on a stone plinth in three dimensions but of course it's actually flat and we have clues surviving on the wall as to what it looked like originally. Okay, as part of our engagement for our visitors and to help them understand and get as excited about this as we are, we're encouraging them to have the opportunity to stand on a plinth, dress up, drape themselves as our figure looked historically, hold some props which are symbols or attributes of the figure, pretend to be the statue themselves and have their photographs taken. Our figure on this side of the house was representing the muse of Erato, which was lyrical poetry and music. So this figure is actually holding a lyre like this. It's quite impressive that it's, you know, they had to uncover it and recreate it again as it was. And um, we were reading about actually how wallpaper had a tax on it, which was quite interesting. We didn't realise that, did we? And then they had three stamps on it. Yeah, and it was taxed for being wallpaper anyway. And then if you painted it or stained it, it was taxed again, which is very interesting. At the time, this scheme was hugely extravagant and costly and was therefore a very important and significant scheme. So for us now to be able to reinstate it is hugely satisfying, knowing that we have put in as much historical accuracy and attention to detail as we possibly can. And this means that we've restored its historical integrity and it's just one way through this phase that we hope to share with you through the Attingham Rediscovered project the excitement of revealing and reviving the Regency splendour of Attingham. Yeah.